Good evening, virtual audience, and welcome. Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Hilary Carr, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I'm very pleased to introduce this event with Kay Miller presenting his new essay collection, Things I Have Withheld, joined in conversation by Julietta Sang. Thank you for joining us tonight. Through virtual events like tonight's, Harvard Bookstore continues to bring authors and their work to our community and our new digital community. Every week we'll be hosting events here on our Zoom account. As always, our event schedule also appears on our website at harvard.com events, where you can sign up for our email newsletter and browse our bookshelves from home. This evening's discussion will conclude with some time for your questions. If you have a question for our speakers at any time throughout the talk tonight, click on the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and we'll get through as many as time allows. This event will also have closed captioning available. Depending on the version of Zoom you're using, you may need to enable captions yourself by clicking on the closed caption button on your screen. In the chat, I'll be posting a link to purchase things I have withheld on harvard.com, as well as a link to donate in support of this series in our store. Your purchases and financial contributions make events like tonight's possible and help to ensure the future of a landmark independent bookstore. Thank you for showing up and tuning in. In support of our authors and the incredible staff of booksellers at Harvard Bookstore, we sincerely appreciate your support now and always. And finally, as you may have experienced in virtual gatherings over this past year, technical issues may arise. If they do, we'll do our best to resolve them quickly. And thank you for your patience and understanding in advance. And now I'm so pleased to introduce tonight's speakers. Kay Miller is an award-winning Jamaican poet, essayist and novelist, and a professor of English at the University of Miami. He's been awarded the Silver Musgrave Medal for his contributions to literature by the Institute of Jamaica, and he's received the Anthony Sabga of Medal for Arts and Letters. He's the author of numerous books. His first short story collection, Fear of Stones and Other Stories, was shortlisted for a Commonwealth Writer's Prize, and his poetry collection, The Cartographer Tries to Map a Way to Zion, won the Forward Poetry Prize. His novel, August Town, won the Bocas Prize for Caribbean Literature and the, and the Prix L'Afrique and the Prix Carré. Tonight, Professor Miller will be joined by Julietta Singh, Associate Professor of English and Gender Studies at the University of Richmond, and author of three books, including her latest, The Breaks, a book of epistolary literary nonfiction. These two will be discussing Prof Professor Miller's latest book, Things I Have Withheld, which was long listed for the Bailey Gifford Prize. In a starred review, Publishers Weekly said the book is as sharp as blades and that Miller's words cut to the core. And BuzzFeed called it a bold and daring collection with no didacticism or sermons, merely curiosity and sometimes anger and a deep commitment to speaking the uncomfortable truths that we'd rather not hear. We're so happy to have them here tonight. So without further ado, the digital podium is yours, Professor Singh and Professor Miller. Thanks, Hillary. Yeah, thanks, Hillary. Thanks for having us. Thanks, thanks, Harvard Bookstore. So um, I wanted to start by saying I, we have just met a few minutes ago for the first time, and um, I'm just figuring out how to how to make us a little bigger because right now you're just a tiny little bullet, and Harvard Bookstore is like the big. Are you <laughs> having the same experience or no? Yeah, now I'm I'm a little bullet as well. Oh, now, now you're very now it's you now you're now you're enlarged. <laughs> Let me see if okay. I can. Here we go. I got it. There um, we go. So I wanted to start by saying this is such a, a gorgeous collection of essays that has really left me gripped and heart wrenched and full of questions for you in turns over the last several days of holding it in my hands and kind of living with it. Um, and I was thinking that things I have withheld feels itself like a beautiful migrant body, one that's carrying and being carried by poetry and fiction as its essay limbs grow <laughs> and extend and reach across so many borders. And now here you are <laughs> having landed in Miami in a very barren looking <laughs> yeah, landscape yeah. With, a, with a wine glass for a water glass that I just noticed I think still has its little tag on the yeah. bottom. <laughs> yeah, I think it does. So, um, so welcome to the United States and, and um, I wish I was there to help you settle in. I thought we could start our conversation by having you read a little bit from the first pages of your collection. Yeah, um, thank you, Juliet. Um, as, yeah, we, 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 we've just met as, as Juliet has said, and I've, I've just had the distinct pleasure of, of living in Juliet's own book, uh, which is just such a joy and a pleasure. It makes me feel very humble to read anything to, to her <laughs> right now or be in conversation uh, with you but but thanks for thanks for having me and I, I look forward to our conversation 
So the first, the first essay is called Letters to James Baldwin, and I'll, I'll read a few excerpts um, from that beginning. Uh, Dear James, it is the body that I wish to write about. These soft houses in which we live and in which we move and from which we can never migrate except by dying. I want to write about our bodies and what they mean and how they mean and how those meanings shift even as our bodies shift throughout the world, throughout time and space. I do not often like to think about my own body or even look at it. Left to itself, my body relishes in fatness and a general lack of definition, though this is not true at the present moment. At the present moment, my body is hard and muscled because I have been swimming and going to the gym and running and trying hard to undo the things that my body would rather do. I look in the mirror now and wonder how long this new shape will last. I do not like to talk about my body because I might have to talk about its weight or else the weight of my insecurities. But I must talk about it because it has meant so many things in so many places. At an immigration desk in Iraq before boarding the plane that will take me away, I am, point I am pointed towards a small room. I cannot remember much about that room now if there were windows or if there was a ceiling fan, its slow blades Uselessly, uselessly stirring the warm air. This is what comes to mind now, a windowless room and a useless ceiling fan, though I am not confident in the memory. In the small room, I am ordered to take off all my clothes. I fear that they will put on latex gloves and they will put a finger inside my body searching for drugs. They will not find any. I wonder when it was that Iraq became a popular departure point for drug mules, but I do not wonder what it is about my body that, her, that has aroused suspicion. I am used to it. I am used to being pointed to small rooms. I am used to being interrogated again and again and again, but I've never been asked to strip before. I stand there with my trousers and my underwear pulled around my ankles. I am aware of the pudginess of my belly, aware of my penis, unimpressive in its flaccidity, aware of a bead of sweat that has escaped the pit of my arm and is now running down my side. They sit, three men in uniform, and silently observe my body. And suddenly, this does not surprise me either. I'll skip right to the end. Um, of this of this series of letters dear james it is always the body that i return to our bodies and their various meanings even though we would like to be just human just that and nothing more but we aren't there yet i think about the little boy i imagine him as three years old who balls up his fists and ineffectively hits his father, this little boy who in this moment in his tiny rage is just human, unsure of how to contain his anger at the world in his small body. And I think about his father who balls up his fist and hits his three-year-old son and how it is the same emotion, but because his body is different, it means differently. The child is not an abuser, but the father is because his body is different. And I think about these things every day when a man says, but why is that sexist? A woman would do it too. Or when a white friend says, but why is that racist? My black friends say the same things. Or when my American friends say, but why is that exceptionalist or fascist? People from every country feel the same way about their countries. And I say it is because of our bodies. It is because there are histories that haunt our bodies. Dear James, I think I am writing these letters to say that I resent your dying. I resent the absence of your shoulders and your hands in this world. I resent the absence of your body, even though I am grateful for the body of work. It is just that I cannot say things any better than you have. I cannot think more graciously than you have. 
but the world and the circumstances that you wrote to the are still here, obstinate world that we have, as if your words did not unravel the things they should have, did not bring down the walls of Jericho, which means we who are left behind must try to write with as much grace and as much love and as much truthfulness as you taught us. But some days I resent this. I resent what you require from us, which is nothing less than you required from yourself. My dear James, I need your help. I've never started a conversation with anybody before crying. <laughs> 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 thank you. Thank you so much. It's very, very beautiful to hear you read um, and really amazingly means something a little bit different to me, having heard you as opposed to sitting in my backyard with the words and, and feeling them in a different way on my own. So thanks for that. Yeah. Um, let's maybe start. We're both um, James Baldwin. Yeah. And our, and our books both kind of oriented in, in interesting ways around him. Um, both of our books are committed to the epistolary form and to letter writing and inspired, I think, both in some ways by Baldwin. So um, maybe let's talk about Baldwin's body and your body and yeah. Baldwin's absent body. There's a lot to say there about the, the body of work and the body and where our yeah. bodies are in relation to our bodies of work. Right. Yeah, it, 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 it's, it's weird, Julia, because my, my PhD was actually on the epistolary, right? So I, I, I think in a weird way, this, this goes back to, you know, that kind of fascination with, um, with why do we write letters, what? Um, that letters are the product of distance. So mm -hmm. that without yeah. distance, there is no letter. And why, and when we go to the letter form, what distance are we trying to cover? Yeah. You know, that, I, I, I think that's, so, so, you know, from very early on as a kind of young, young academic, that was, that was my fascination. So, so, so it's interesting to come back to it. And, you know, when James Baldwin presented himself as, as that is someone across a distance that I want to write to, uh, because the first person uh, that, I mean, haunts his collection, uh, in a slightly larger way than Baldwin is, is obviously the brand. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and, but, and again, it's the same thing. It, it's, it's thinking of her body and that, that beautiful address that she gave in Canada um, yeah. years yeah. ago. Yeah. Um, but yeah, um, but, but more to your question, for James Baldwin, I, bringing those ideas together, I guess at some point this, that first essay, it was me rescuing about four or five essays that failed, uh -huh. right? And it failed because they were too direct, uh -huh. um, because I, I was struggling with how to be vulnerable in them, how to be truthful, how to say my truth, and how to not you know, say something without accusing, all of that. And I realized the beauty of the letter, right, is that if you find the right person to write to, you don't mind people overhearing. Yeah. That's really interesting, yeah. And then I can say what I want to say and you don't feel accused because you're only overhearing this conversation. Yeah. Um, and that that just felt, there are all kinds of possibilities that opened up. And, and it was because of James Baldwin's body. It's because James Baldwin's body is black and male and queer. And he grew up in a, this kind of, you know, Pentecostal religious Christian background. There's so many ways in which his body was echoing my own. Mm -hmm. But more than that, he was he was thoughtful and his mind was rigorous, and I could risk these difficult truths to him. Um, and that, that yeah, it, it, it rescued those essays because suddenly I could turn my head away from the people I was writing to at first and say, no, just just overhear me talking to somebody who I trust. Yeah. Um, and yeah, that, that, that's how that came in. But it's interesting too, because it's, it's more, it, it feels to me more than, I love that formulation of, of the letter. It's such a beautiful way to think and really helps me actually to think about what I've done in my book too. <laughs> so thanks for that offering. But it feels too like um, Baldwin is not the only 
um, person to whom you write a letter in this collection or to whom you write a series of, of letters. And so when you turn toward the end of the book to your friend who has passed away, to another very famous kind of amazing writer, you're writing to black gay male writers from around the world in some yeah. way. And it's a very extraordinary reach. And I think you're writing to them in different ways. Can you talk about that? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, the, that, that, the answer that comes to, uh, to binge, to Binyalanga. Um, well, I mean, you're right that, but that I do think the reach goes beyond volume, but, but that's a kind of literary gesture, isn't it? That, um, <laughs> Uh, which, which I'm sure you you are so deeply aware of with your book that is the, that is written, you know, with its gaze turned towards your daughter. Yeah. But there are so many times reading your book where I just I thought I felt uncomfortable with how direct that I felt addressed. Mm. I just thought you you know you she knows she's talking to me now. <laughs> um, so, it's, but the literary letter always does that. It, it's aware of these two audiences. Um, so on one hand, yes, there, there, there's this kind of black queer community that I'm writing to, but I think it, it, it it's even broader than that. Um, so you'll, I mean, I, I don't know if anyone is interested in those, these kinds of literary tricks, but opening with Baldwin gave me these, these echoes that I could use. So even when the other essays aren't letters at all, it could go back to this thing that was introduced this is what happened. Yeah. It brings us back into the epistolary space, but the address is totally. all the way in. Yeah. yeah. That was definitely carefully, that, that was definitely a trick that I was using to go, I will start with the epistolary and I'm going to put all kinds of echoes that will linger in the other essays that draw you back into that, into the intimate space of the letter, because I love, I love the intimacy of the letter. I like Mm -hmm. what a safe space is it, space it is so even though the other s's weren't letters i kept on reminding you of that initial address absolutely and you, <laughs> huh? you succeeded you nailed it oh, good. Um, but there's something really interesting because i feel like in the in the letters to baldwin you're deeply desiring a friendship with someone whom you can't claim as a friend, even though right. in a very queer way, you, the letter is a, a, a gesture of friendship. Yeah. Um, but but Binge is someone with whom you actually had a friendship and, and you get to call him Binge as opposed to James, who you want to call Jimmy, but you can't. Right, right, yeah. I never thought weird. about that, that's true. Yeah, it's very interesting the way it sutures your your whole kind of collection together. And, and you're right that the Baldwin letters that open this collection really, um, you know, stimulate us, open us to all kinds of questions that you're going to be asking. But I was thinking less about the way that the specificity of writing to gay gay men who have passed away was, a. I, I was thinking about it more along what you were saying, which is that when you write to the right person, you get to open up a kind of world that speaks to so many others, right? And it's interesting to think about yeah. one being someone, someone who, um, precedes you whom you'll never know and so right. you know but can no longer yeah hang with you know yeah and, and it's and it's strange how both those uh because i i think i fell in love with baldwin you know after he'd already gone of course i i knew of him you know probably our whole lives but when i fell in love with him it was the pain of oh my god i'm I now love someone who it is impossible to know. Yes. How brutally unfair is this world? Yes. Um, and I think, I think even with Binge, um, you know, meeting him was so incredible. He was such a fascinating mind. Um, and I think I understood so much more of, when, when I talk about it in this, it, a sense of unraveling that was happening in the end. Yeah. And I don't think I was sympathetic enough to what was happening. And the pain of that after was, oh my God, I, you were dying. You were dying and I did not know. Yeah, yeah. And, and I, I, I just kind of accused myself of the lack of empathy. Or, but it's, 
It's interesting too, because it ties back to your title, Things I Have Withheld, which I read somewhere in, in scoping you out and getting ready to be in conversation with you, had an alternate title for a while. And now I'm forgetting what that alternate title was, but you 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 kind of borrowed the things I have withheld or elaborated it from Dion Brand, whom you mentioned already. Yeah, um, well, it was always Dion Brand. The other title would have been the most important thing. So it's, it's too much. The most harsh. important thing, exactly. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, oh yeah. Okay, so it's a different, it's a different riff. Um, but, but I wanted to talk to you a little bit about this notion of withholding um, because she's writing about the divides between blackness and whiteness. And she's telling us that there are things that she'll say to us and things that she won't. Um, and then she says that quite possibly the most important things to say will be the ones that she withholds. Yeah. And, and I'm interested in what you're doing here with the, the, the kind of question of withholding because, um, well, you, you tell me about withholding. I, I have a, I, I see withholding operating in, in kind of multiple ways across your essays and some of them fall in line very much with the kind of Dion Brandian notion that she's formulating there like some of the most important things I'm not going to say but you're trying to also say some of those you're in, in oh some yeah way. yeah I mean absolutely I, I think I think it's one of those moments where what Brand said struck me as so truthful or, or it echoed it resonated with so much of my life mm -hmm. That and 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 it's and there are so many of these essays that try to bring us back to these moments, moments that I thought in this moment, I am not allowed to say something that I think is so strikingly obvious. Yeah. And I'm not allowed to say it because of race or just because it will introduce a kind of discomfort. And at the same time, I think, but how do we say those things? Like, why, why are we condemned to withholding? Yeah. Uh, you know what? And, and what is the risk? What, what would it take to finally say those things which we teach ourselves to withhold? And which I think in a way is stifling. And it's not only stifling, it risks the quality of friendships that we might have. It risks the, the kind of love that we might share with each other. It risks, it, 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 it sacrifices all these things. Yeah. And so though, though I recognize what Fran said as absolutely truthful, I thought the risk I want to take is to not withhold those things, is to say them. Um, and, and so that that felt to me the ultimate project of the book, uh, mm -hmm. to, to, to start from that point of departure, to acknowledge that truth, that that is, that is true for so many brown people and queer people that we always withhold, we are taught to withhold, but how do you create a space to say those things? Yeah, and also the, the disease of withholding, like literally the way that withholding yeah. manifests in our bodies and, right. and, and creates kind of pathology and, and sickness. Yeah. Yeah. Um, can, we, can we pivot slightly to yeah. the Black mothers? Because I, um, I was really, really blown away by the old Black woman who sat in the corner which comes very early on in your collection. And um, I wondered if you could just tell us about Miss Henny, um, the black woman in the corner of your own history, whom you say might be the story of my entire island. Yeah, wow. Uh, uh, that, that essay in particular, it was, that, that's a weird one because I, I almost wrote that as a novel so many times, right? Yeah, it feels like a novel. It feels yeah. like a novel. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it, yeah, it, it obviously has all the markers of that. Um, and so, I mean, without, without, like, I don't want to reveal too much, or do I, do I, I'll just talk about it. You can talk about it. I think there's yeah. no spoilers here. Yeah, it's just so, amazing when you get to read the words themselves, everything changes. Yes, so, so this is a strange thing. My, um, the essay starts with something that my grandmother says one Christmas. She gets up and she says, um, I want, before I die, you know, she's a 94 year old woman at this point. She said, before I die, we should talk about some of the things, some of the decisions we made in those early days, because I know it's caused some pain. And everyone in the family, they jump up and they try to shut up my grandmother. It's, 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 it's bizarre. And my sister calls and she says, oh my God, grandma is ready to talk. 
And so this is the whole story that my grandmother tells. And it involves all kinds of weird secrets in our family, right? Uh, but but, but without, without making you reveal the secrets, we can say the essay kind of hinges on the, the Black mothers who are not were not mentioned. We're not or recognized as such. Are, are not recognized. Uh, I mean, I, and I could, I, I can tell you easily, like one of the stories within that, like one of the stories within that essay, is again, this is my 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 dad and my grandmother and some of his sisters talking, and somehow in the midst of this conversation, they mention this woman. It would be my dad's aunt, my grandmother's sister-in-law, who was arrested for murder. <laughs> And it just slips out, right? And I go, wait, what? <laughs> like how? When? Wait, what? And it was it was amazing how they kind of they kind of scrambled to pick back up the story and push it back into the corner. And but I'd already heard it. I'd heard that I'd heard the edge of it, and I went, no, no, you're not putting this story back in the dark. Tell me what happened. And the story is told to me with such resentment. <laughs> because how how are we so careless that we made the boy, the writer, care the bit of the story? It's gonna go public. <laughs> yeah. And when you hear the whole story, it you you are immediately sympathetic to the woman. Yeah. Uh, she, I mean, she, yeah. she wasn't some, she wasn't some like awful criminal. She yeah. was a woman who was trying to raise animals, and a pradial larceny thief keeps on coming in and stealing from the whole village. And the village as a whole, they gather together and they set up for this thief. And she's part of the mob that unfortunately kills him. <laughs> so she goes to jail for money. Uh, what is interesting in that story is at the end, I asked my grandmother, so what was her name? This is your brother's wife. This is your sister-in-law. I say, what was her name? And my grandmother says, oh, Lord, I can't remember. She she was Haitian. <laughs> and that, enough said. <laughs> and, and you see that she was Haitian says two things. It says one, it was a French name. Why am I going to remember that? But two, and this is the alarming thing, it says she was black. Yeah. And that might seem a bizarre thing. If, we, if you come from a black family, why would there be this yeah, anti-black yeah. sentiment within a black family? And yet it's so common. And I guess that's what I began to think. I began to think about all these kind of surprising little stories that I've heard in my own family. And I've heard in other families, my friends' families, and it always, almost always involved silencing a black woman or putting a black woman back in a corner or not allowing the story of the black woman to be told. And I just thought, Jesus Christ, this is not just my family's story. It is, it is Jamaica's story. Why do we do that? Um, and, and so in one hand, I am telling this, I am telling these stories within my family, but it's because I think it's a much larger story than that. And I think, I think that's just something we do. Uh, I think you might be able to tell me why we do that. I am still at the point of just being fascinated, um, by this serial burial. Uh, so why do you think, I mean, why, why, why does that become pathological on, on, on an island like that, that you suppress the stories of? Black woman. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. I, I, I obviously can't answer that incredible question. Um, but but I but it's interesting to think about in some ways how um, how your collection later returns to it. I'm not sure if if this is something that's gonna like that you're hyper aware of. This is why I love being in conversation with other people about my work because I <laughs> I don't really know what I've done, you know. But there's this moment when um, in my brother, my brother. Um, which comes much later in the collection where you're you're narrating this scene where you're at the market in Ghana yeah. and and you ask a, a woman who's selling mangoes if she speaks English and because of how you look she looks at you with such scorn um, <laughs> yeah. that, that you can only approach her in English and you imagine that she's blaming it on your mother. You say like, she didn't seem to be looking at me. She was looking beyond me. She was looking at something behind me, I think you said. Yeah. And, and the thing that you imagine behind you is your mother and this kind of economy of, of burial or blame or dismissal or scorn kind of repeats again. 
across yeah, yeah. across the world, you know. Yeah, no, I never I never thought of that connection, but yeah, that does, and 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 it's so weird that I, I mean, I'm completely imagining this moment, but do you know what? In that moment in Ghana, I felt sure that that was what was happening. Right, <laughs> right, 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 yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think those I think those like hunches are important. And I, you know, for for as much as I see you in this collection, really trying to um, animate some of those very oppressed figures, the black woman, but also um, the, the, the gully queens who who appear um, across a couple of your stories. We should talk about that and queerness because I really wondered in those um, stories, which also felt very much like a novel. <laughs> yeah. well, maybe everything is a novel <laughs> to unfold, but um, but I, I wondered about these queer youth whom you're kind of hanging with, yeah. but hanging with as an outsider, like not them, very and, much, but, but very much like with them and thinking with them and trying to understand kind of where they're at. And I, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about them and what they mean to this collection, but also how you understand yourself as someone who's who's writing about queerness and writing about your own queerness, but also writing about other kinds of queerness. At the yeah, same time. I, I don't know if I fully understand what I was doing with them yet. Mm -hmm. um, I, I know partly. I mean, I, I don't think I ever said this. Not, not, not in the essays that in which they appear. That I think there was something in my mind initially when I first made contact with this with this group of guys that I I thought I was researching a novel. Mm -hmm. And eventually, as this friendship developed, it feels too exploitative, right? Yeah. That that kind of relationship and it feels it suddenly feels I'm, I'm too aware of my power uh, and, and that becomes <laughs> the, the, you know because in so many of the essays that I'm thinking about you know how do I exist in, in white societies how do I exist in this kind of and in this moment I am the empowered one yeah. and, and that's difficult to reckon with um, but I, I know at some point in our friendship, I thought I can't fictionalize this. Yeah. Um, and I guess the other thing that became apparent, even even as I know that I, I don't want to he heroize them because they are problematic in certain ways, right? <laughs> right. Um, they they do bad things. Um, I knew that if I wrote that essay or any essay in which they appeared, they would have to read it first, yeah. and I could only publish it if they approved. Yeah. <laughs> And so, I mean, I, 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 I don't know what the conclusion of all of that is, but I know it felt important to befriend them and to think about my own power um, and to think about just that relationship of humility and getting their permission. Um, all those negotiations just felt important to me in this kind of collection because it was... I, I, I was just confronting myself in very weird and uncomfortable ways. Yeah, um, yeah. And, I, and again, I, I don't think I've worked all of this through. I, I just know I can think about the, the my my own emotions going through, mm -hmm. writing it and thinking through it and giving it to them to read it and asking them, what do you think? Have I, have I done it fairly? Um, have I compromised you in any way? I, I don't want the police to come for you because <laughs> I've just told them what you did, you know? Yeah. Is that is that um, is the impulse to clear um, your writing with with people whom you write about? Is that impulse only in situations where you feel like you're holding the power? No, not not really. Um, so that even one of the essays that became ridiculously controversial. <laughs> the no, yeah, that's, that's my next move. <laughs> Um, That's where I'm going. <laughs> I sent it to all of them before. Interesting. Uh, so though it became a big deal, what no one said or acknowledged in all of that hurrah yeah. is yeah. that before I sent it to every one of those women. Interesting. I said, what do so, you think? And, so let's, let's describe what we're, what we're talking about here because it's an essay in which you're writing about white female Jamaican writers. And well, white female Caribbean writers. Huh? Right, right, uh, right. Yeah. Um, right. And yeah, so I, 
I guess, so, so in the essay, I was, uh, there was a few moments in the Caribbean where white women were, you know, were interrogated for one reason or the other. There are a couple of moments where I thought that interrogation was unfair mm -hmm. because it was robbing them of citizenship. Um, you know, they, they, there's a way in which some someone housed in my body, I will, my Jamaicanness or my Caribbeanness will never be questioned. Yeah because of my body it is and no one wants to acknowledge that, that is a privilege that we walk in but it is yeah. and someone else who is absolutely born for generations in the caribbean but they live in a white body they always they are always questioned are you really caribbean though of course they're caribbean mm -hmm. um, and so i wanted to think through these moments but there are a couple of moments where i thought that interrogation was absolutely right and it was yeah. deserved and i wanted how do we work through that complication where in this moment that's questionable, but these questions ought to be asked. Um, and so, so I write this essay. I, I, I tell the woman I'm writing, I'm writing this essay. They're they're happy about it. They they give me feedback. But and then it comes out, and one of them gets absolutely pissed. Mm -hmm. And what's weird is that uh, that exactly what I'm trying to narrate that sense of entitlement. Um, that sense of how dare I be questioned. All of what I describe is exactly how the reaction unfolds. Yeah. Um, and it's it, 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 it becomes a way, I remember going back to the UK and picking up the Guardian and seeing my, my picture in, <laughs> on the front page of the art section and it says, incendiary essay by Kai Miller causes tension across the Caribbean. Wow. And it's, but it's a power of whiteness, right? I mean, it, it's a story that we know now because of what happened in Central Park with um, that woman that if a black male makes a white woman uncomfortable, there's a point where she can say, how dare you? How mm -hmm. dare you make me question anything? And she will try to call on all manner of, you know, power and authority to discipline you. And, and even that I wanted to work through. What is, I think the body of, the white woman is able to, because I'm thinking about all the kinds of powers we are able to access. And I thought the body of the white woman, even in the Caribbean, has access to a kind of damsel privilege. If I am hurt or if I am uncomfortable, I can go, oh, whoa. And everyone is taught to run in and go, oh my God, are you all right? And I just wanted to question that. And that's what I was questioning in this essay. Um, yeah. And I, I think it's, you know, it's, 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 um, there's something interesting to me about that's the backstory to that um, controversy is is really interesting, but there's something interesting to me too about the ways that in your um, very subtle and supple um, investigations, I don't know if that's the right word, but like um, of race across these essays, I think there are moments when um, you know, whiteness, whiteness um, feels very different along gendered lines. So when you're writing about that subtle <laughs> racism of white men that that is not subtle at all in these collections, I um, I'm just like, yes, not nodding along. And then there's something that happens in the the ways that white women pop up, not just in this essay, but elsewhere you called it in this essay a kind of damsel effect but to me it feels like you're more disappointed in the white women than you are in the men in the men you're more like fuck you <laughs> and well, with women there's this kind of like um in these various scenes like the 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 like profound horror of of um the the, I'm thinking of the 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 Elmina Castle right. getting her photo taken, or the women who are kind of like sitting compa complacently by while racism unfolds. And there's a kind of sense in your yeah. life that you like you want more from them. Yeah, but I I think you're probably right, and, and I think it's because I do want to think about that interaction a few times. Um, or to think through it some more. And it's it's the white woman and the black man who I always think of as 
one step away from power in two different ways. Yeah. The black man has male privilege, but not white privilege. Yeah. The white woman has white privilege, but not male privilege. And they are tussling. And that, and I think there's something about that tussle that has to do with them being in different ways, one step away from power. Yeah. And I think that demands interrogation, that demands introspection. Yeah. And when I don't get that introspection from the white one who isn't thinking through how this dance of power and how do we become complicit and how do we recognize our complicity in this weird power scheme where we're both trying to be the white man, how do you give up on that yeah. and do something more ethical? When I don't see that, when I don't see that recognition, I think you are right. I am disappointed in a way that with the figure of the white man, I just think, meh. What can you <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah, I'm going to read you back to yourself just for a second. You write, things is never straightforward. Sometimes a man like me will wield worlds against, words against the white woman and the blade of those words are sharpened by the stone of his own insecurities. But another time, the man will wield world, words against the white woman, and the blade of these words are sharpened by the stone of truth. And it's such a perfect way of explaining that kind of tense relation that's like mm, pa parallel, but totally yeah. the same. And, and it, absolutely, because that, that is a complication that I wanted to think through. Because I, I think, again, I think that some of those interactions that happen in the Caribbean that I'm writing about between the black woman and the white, between the, 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 the black man and the white woman, sometimes the black man was completely in the wrong, yeah. completely in the wrong. And, and again, he wasn't being thoughtful about it. Mm -hmm. I just thought, let's, you know, the story isn't always the same. Let's, let, let's work through the complications of it. Yeah. yeah. Um, I know that we have to Turn to questions. Yeah. I see that oh there are, my God. but I but I want to ask you just for for a quick second about trauma before we shift over because this reminds me of the ways that you're illustrating. Um, I think the end of this collection really like hits us with the the beginning of the collection begins with a kind of little preface that that explains a kind of volatile situates us within a volatile relationship that you're in where you're made to to feel and act and be much smaller than you should be or that you are or doesn't match your 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 demeanor or your physical being and i resonated with that so much it was like an, an extraordinary kind of beginning but it it takes us from these kind of like this this kind of micro scene of your own intimate or not intimate life and then brings us all the way to the end through these many beautiful essays where we're left to grapple with um the extreme brutal violence of of um of murder of state state sanctioned murder of black bodies and i wanted to think a little bit about um where where trauma is for you in in um maybe this is too big of a question to kind of throw at you toward the end but but to think about trauma as um there's a moment when you're talking about almost getting mugged for instance where you say trauma um is something that one earns and I was, it was making me think about trauma. Like you're, you're saying, like, I don't really get to talk about this trauma that I almost suffered. I almost right. got mugged, but I didn't get mugged. Um, but the whole kind of collection is making us think about the embodiment of traumas, huge and small. Right. And every kind of interaction is, is, um, earning is such an interesting way to think about it, but it's like accruing in our bodies and, right. and making us up in some way yeah um I, I i i don't know how to answer that uh and you mean particularly particularly because today i've been i've been reading your book i mean i i, I i've been reading this this hyper visceral narration of your own body of, of of how your body disappoints of what happens in your body and how do we talk about it uh and that essay in particular is talking about what 
what does not happen to the body what almost happened to the body yeah. <laughs> you know and, yeah. and, and, and i think that's ex it's exactly putting those two things together in which i think oh my god i i haven't earned the right to talk about this you know but uh, it's really interesting because it you're almost i this is totally an aside but i got jumped in exactly the same way that you almost got jumped, where you right. described the sort of like enfolding of these really? bodies around you. That was my my mugging circa 2007, but in where? the Bay area. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but but with a machete. Um, so so no, you know, definitely, but but you're regardless of whether or not it's followed through to some fantasy of an end point, it still happened. You know, you yeah, still and... experience the surround, you still experience the like the 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 unfolding of it, even if it didn't unfold all the way. And that it lingers, right? Um, and, that it lingers. and and so, so on one hand, I'm saying I don't know if I have the right to talk about it, or I'm or, or again, I'm 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 trying, I'm probably this is ways in which I am thinking too much. I, mean, I, I never like that word. I, I don't think we ever overthink anything. Yeah, um, likewise. But, um, but I'm trying to be so aware of my body that I am aware that even though, you know, I'm talking about my, that, that sometimes I, I don't like living in this big, tall, black male body. I am also aware that that body protected me. Yeah. That I got to walk away from that situation partly because of my body, because those three muggers were smaller than me. And they didn't know that I was just a queer, fright little boy who would have screamed the moment they did anything. <laughs> there is there's this moment of them just being unsure, like, this guy can fuck us up. Yeah. <laughs> well, you threw a punch, which is pretty badass. I, 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 I did throw a punch and then ran. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, um, yes, I, again, I, I, but probably this is what the essay is. It, it's a place where we're allowed to be unsure. And that's just one moment where I go, I, I don't know what to make of this. I know I feel trauma in my body. I know for days after that trauma was lingering and yet I know I was protected because of my body. Yeah. And how do I, how do I make sense of these two truths? Yeah. Um, yeah. I love that. I love, I love that kind of opening that we can't really close, but I think that's the thing is hanging, yeah. hanging those two, those two things open together. Let's, yeah. um, let's answer, let's, let's answer some of these questions. Oh yeah. So, I didn't even know that. I'll, I'll read some out to you. So um, the first person asks, do you find it hard to switch from fiction to nonfiction slash poetry to prose? What do you find are the strengths of one over the other? Are there certain ideas that can only be expressed in certain genres? I think certain ideas lend themselves to, to certain genres. Uh, they, uh, I don't know if I find it hard anymore. I, I, I think very early on the idea uh, tells me what it wants to be. So, 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 so there are different impulses that I have. There is, there is the impulse to tell a story. By, by God, I love telling stories. And, and oftentimes, even though that that can be folded into the essay, oftentimes as you, as you as you would have read, I mean, I just I'll break at any given point to tell you a story. Yeah. <laughs> um, but if the impulse is just to complicate that story and to uh, tell this bigger story out of it, I know that's the novel. Um, but when this when the story is in service of an idea, that I am fundamentally trying to work through an idea. I know that I need to essay. And, and even if the end product looks like fiction, feels like fiction, at the heart of it is I'm working through an idea. And that for me is always the essay. But my essays absolutely will look like fiction. Yeah. Um, and they do. And, <laughs> they do. Yeah. Um, and, and then there is just my absolute fascination with language that there is there are moments when I, there's this need to move lyrically through something, to make sometimes an argument, but I don't want to make it quote unquote sensibly. I want to do something lyrical. I, I, I want to dive into a word. I want to find out what other words live beside these words and how do you move from this word and paint something bigger. And that doesn't, that doesn't make sense in the usual way. Um, yeah, the, that kind of impulse, those impulses feel separate to me. And I think now I can tell what, where those impulses are leading to. And I think the strategies I use 
ultimately are very different. Um, so I, I think it was harder to tell at one point, but these days it is, I find it easier to know who I am as a novelist that is separate from who I am as an essayist and that is separate from who I am as a poet, it, even though it's the same person, you know. Um, yeah, this, this lends really, really nicely into the next question. Thank you for joining us tonight. Your reading really captured the beautiful sonic quality of your writing. When you write, or maybe when you edit, do you read your work aloud to get a sense of the musical quality of your sentences? Oh, um, absolutely. Definitely. Um, over and over obsessively. Um, <laughs> even, even when I'm writing a novel, it, 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 is, it, it is so, it's almost sick. There are, in the moment of writing a novel, I can probably sit down and read to you five pages straight mm -hmm. without looking at it because I, because I, I obsess and I, I, I don't know how it is with you because your writing feels so lyrical, Julieta. Um, I know now that I can make decisions based on sound and, and I don't know what I'm responding to, but I just know that that word feels wrong. Yeah. Um, and, and after a while I am editing based on sound rather than even sense. I mean, yeah. are you editing that way after a while? Yeah. I think it, I it feels know. obvious that you do to me because it's, it's yeah. Yeah, yeah. so beautifully that it's obviously you're hearing it. Yeah, I love editing for that reason because I think, you know, I spend, I labor a lot over sentences to begin with, but I, I end up in editing really getting into a kind of rhythm, getting into a kind of, um, yeah, like a, a sound quality along with the, the, the labor of words, I think, in those, in those final stages that, that never feel final, but you know. Yeah. But can I ask you about genre as well, and, and specifically moving between the language of theory yeah. and the language of academia yeah. and the lyrical mode that you find in here, and, 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 and how do they speak to each other? Because cause I find there is traffic happening between, or I wonder if there's traffic happening between, yeah. but how do you end up with prose like that is so lyrical, so beautiful, but so, to me, informed? by the theoretical and the richness of that. Yeah, I think I really, you know, I'm a person who I'm, I'm, a, I'm an academic and was trained as an academic. And um, to me, that means I really, I have really lived in theory for a long time. And so, you know, I, I used to kind of shuttle back and forth between like mm -hmm. writing secret poems and, and <laughs> really trying to grapple with the like weight and, and density of theory yeah. um, as two kind of separate poles. And I think over time, I came to realize that that I, I found in myself a kind of poetic voice through my engagements with theory, that like theory okay. and the questions that it asks and the orientations that it opens us toward are, are for me pathways into lyricism. Okay. even though we often think about them as completely separate kind right. of devices. Um, so the, 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 the combining of those things is, is actually very organic to me because it's, right. it's, it is the, the wholeness of my orientation. I think theoretically, yeah. I live theoretically, I breathe theoretically, and I also have always been very, very language driven. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I wish I had a magic <laughs> answer yeah. for like a calculus for for. No, no, no but it it shows it that yeah. Again, just the the, the traffic is beautiful between. The yeah, two. and I and I feel seamless. I feel that way with you, where I'm like, am I reading poetry? Am I reading fiction? Or am I reading <laughs> like a memoiristic essay? And in the end, you know, I think those distinctions between genre can be very reductive. Yeah. Um, and, and I think your work is like, to me, the, the best, most beautiful example of the, the, the ways in which we don't have to ab abide by those distinctions that in fact, we can circulate in all of them at once without really worrying about it. <laughs> yeah. Um, somebody asks here, um, can you both speak more to the power of epistolary writing? Um, I feel like you wrote a, a dissertation on it, so. <laughs> Um, so you should go. Um, what do you find so powerful about it? Do you find there's something different in addressing the living versus addressing the dead in these works? Uh, 
I, I don't know if I can say more. So, so I'll, I'll, I'll hand it over, over to you really quickly. You've written the whole epistolary. Yeah. <laughs> uh, of essays, which is a wonderful genre in and of itself. Um, but no, I, 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 I mean, I, I'll repeat what I said before. I, I think there is, there is a kind of intimacy that the letter provides um, that isn't as available in in other kinds of writing. I'm not saying that it's not, but it's not as available. Um, and ultimately, um, and, and I think Julieta's work um, exploits, or exploit is the wrong word, but it, it showcases even more than mine. It's, it's the ability to be vulnerable. Like I knew in a work like this, I had to be vulnerable. Um, and the epistolary offers that as well. Um, in a place, in a way that doesn't feel too maudlin or, um, but but yeah, you 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 have you have to show yourself. Um, and, and again, I, I think your work does that. I mean, what what is the, what was the power of the epistolary for you? I think you know, I think you just sort of taught me how to think about it inadvertently in your in your opening um, remarks about the epistolary because I think for me, you know, I was thinking so much about my my book is. A letter to my daughter, um, who's quite young, about um, race, inheritance, and mothering at the end of the world. And yours is written to um, men who are no longer with us. But but both of us are using the epistolary form as a kind of reach for another world. Yeah. And I think that that your your kind of way of thinking about who we choose to write to, you know, whether they're living or whether they're dead, the, 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 the subject to whom we write opens the door for a much yeah. wider and much more capacious set of questions and discussions and a, and a you or, you know, a, a James or um, a binge or a you mm -hmm. in, in the case of the breaks mm -hmm. where, um, where we're writing to a singular person who is also proliferating and multiple and 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 always kind of endlessly plural. And yeah. so I think the epistolary for me allows for that specificity and that intimacy of address at the same time as it blows open a very wide yeah. um, and, and unanticipatable network of like an, an inclusion of, yeah. of, of bodies and minds coming together in that in that intimate form. Yeah. Yeah. What a pleasure to spend an hour. Absolutely. I'm so and glad that we got to read each other and that we got to meet. Yeah, I, I am too. Thank you. I, I want to come over there and help you. <laughs> you in and I help you set you up, know. please. Yeah. <laughs> I'd love I'll to. I'll send you a ticket. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you both. This was so wonderful. It was wonderful to hear you both speak. Um, so thank you to Professor Miller and to Professor Singh. Thanks to everybody out there who spent your evening with us. You can learn more about these, these important books and purchase them both on harvard.com. And on behalf of Harvard Bookstore here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, everybody have a good night. Keep reading and please, please be well. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thanks. Thanks.